Greetings to you, our insightful listeners, and welcome back to Stock Explorers. Today, we're taking a deep dive into a company right in the thick of the energy storage conversation. EOS, Energy Enterprises. Uh, Picker EOS. That's right, EOS. They're developing and manufacturing uh, something pretty interesting. The Z3 Aqueous Zinc Battery. It's aimed squarely at stationary energy storage. Exactly. So... For you listeners thinking about potential investments, we're going to break down their business model, look at the you know the good and the bad, the positives and negatives, mm. and maybe try to get a handle on when they might actually turn profitable. We'll try and make it clear, use some examples. Okay, so let's start with the basics. What is EOS actually doing? Their core business is making and selling this Z3 energy storage system. Built on their own zinc battery tech, right? Precisely. Aqueous zinc. And they're targeting specific markets big grid scale projects, commercial and industrial users, the CNI space. Okay. And also microgrids. Think places needing power for say three to twelve hours straight. Right. That three to twelve hour duration seems key for them. How does the Z3 thing compare to, well, the dominant player, lithium ion? Ah, good question. The big selling point number one is safety. They use a water based electrolyte. It's non flammable. Water based. So less fire risk compared to lithium. Significantly less. You avoid that whole thermal runaway concern, which is a huge deal for some installations, makes it inherently safer. Okay. Safety. What else? Well, that long duration capability we mentioned, 3 to 12 hours, that's a sweet spot lithium ion sometimes struggles with cost effectively. Hmm. Plus lifespan. They're talking over 20 years, 6,000 cycles, and importantly, minimal capacity loss over time. 6,000 cycles? 20 years. That's impressive longevity. It is. And it operates over a wide temperature range, which adds flexibility. Oh, and you can discharge it completely, like 100% depth of discharge without hurting the battery health long term. That's a useful feature. Oh. What about the materials? Sustainability is a big topic now. Right. They emphasize using readily available stuff, zinc, carbon, some plastics, and sourcing much of it uh, domestically within the U.S. Which ties into the manufacturing too, doesn't it? They make it here. Yes, domestic manufacturing. That positions them potentially quite well for benefits under the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA. Think tax credits. Okay. And how do they sell it directly? Yeah, direct to customer. They handle the delivery, the logistics, builds relationships, but adds complexity too. Got it. Okay, let's pivot to the positives. What's looking good for EOS right now from an investor's viewpoint? Revenue seems like a place to start. Definitely. Q1 2025 was a record for them. $10.5 million in revenue. Record quarter. How does that compare? Well, it's a big jump. 58% up from the same quarter last year. 58% year over year. Okay. And 44% up from just the previous quarter, Q4 2024. Mostly driven by shipping more systems out the door. So deliveries are increasing. What about production itself? Are they actually making more? Seems like it. The volume they shipped in just Q1 of this year uh, actually surpassed their entire shipment volume for all of 2024. Wow. Okay. So in three months, more than all of last year, that suggests the production ramp up is, well, ramping up. Exactly. It's a strong indicator they're figuring out how to scale production. And linked to that is gross margin improvement. Ah, profitability. Or at least closer to it. Well, moving in that direction at the gross level, a huge improvement year over year, like 93 percentage points better on the gross margin percentage. 93 points. How? Lower costs to make the Z3 product itself, plus efficiencies for making more of them. Higher volumes helping absorb fixed costs. It's a good sign, but, you know, starting from a very low base. Right. Still, progress. And the tech itself, you mentioned safety duration. Yeah, the Z3 is positioned as that safe, long-duration, U.S.-made alternative. That's the narrative. And they keep working on costs. They apparently cut costs by 64% since they first launched the Z3. Cost reduction is key for competitiveness. Absolutely. And a big part of the future cost reduction story is automation. Ah, robots taking over. Well, automating parts of the assembly line, they're doing it in stages. The idea is to drastically cut labor costs and speed things up. Any proof that'll work. Early tests look promising. One part, terminal automation, they reported like a 78% cut in labor needed and a 363% increase in output. Okay, those are big numbers. When does this automation fully kick in? They're expecting full implementation early in Q3 2025. So second half of this year should really show the impact if it works as planned. Could be a real game changer for scaling. And they need money to scale. How's the funding situation? They've secured some significant financing recently. There's a $210.5 million loan from Cerberus, which is fully funded. Cerberus, yeah. And a big one. 
a $303.5 million loan guarantee from the Department of Energy. That's for their manufacturing expansion, Project A Kali. A DOE loan guarantee. That's usually seen as a strong vote of confidence. Right? It definitely helps de-risk things for other lenders and signals government support. Crucial funding for their plans. What about future business? Orders. Look strong on paper. They have an order backlog of $680.9 million. That's about 2.6 gigawatt hour. $680 million booked. Oh, nice. And the pipeline, potential future deals. Even bigger, a $15.6 billion opportunity pipeline, they say. Uh, that's 60 gigawatt hours. Includes some large international agreements, too. MOUs, mind you. Not firm orders yet. MOUs. Yeah. Memorandums of understanding. So agreements in principle. Exactly. One in the UK with Frontier Power for 5 gigawatt hours. Another in Puerto Rico for 400 megawatt hours. And interestingly, they mentioned seeing more traction in the data center market. Data centers need reliable power. Makes sense. You mentioned the IRA earlier. How significant are those policy benefits? Potentially very significant. The production tax credits alone could be worth over $45 per kilowatt hour produced domestically. 45 bucks per kilowatt hour. That adds up fast. It really does. And their customers might get extra investment tax credit bonuses for using U.S.-made gear like EOS's. It sweetens the deal considerably. So are they partnering with anyone? Yes, they have a joint development agreement with FlexGen. The idea is to offer a combined integrated battery storage solution. They're targeting a shared pipeline of 50 gila WH together. Okay. And any changes in leadership? Sometimes that signals a shift. They've made several recent board and leadership appointments. Names like Joseph Negro, David Urban bringing in expertise seemingly focused on scaling up and execution. So strengthening the team for the next phase, and finally, that American-made angle. Yeah, it's a strong narrative right now, politically and economically, yeah. favoring domestic manufacturing, energy independence. EOS fits right into that story. Could be a real advantage. Okay, that's a compelling list of positives. But we need the full picture. Let's talk about the risks, the challenges, the negative points investors need to watch. Absolutely. First off, despite that record revenue in Q1, it actually missed analyst expectations. Miss expectations. Why? It highlights a potential challenge. Converting production into recognized revenue isn't always straightforward, especially with their direct-to-customer model. Logistics, project timing, it can be complex. So execution hiccups in getting paid, essentially. What about actual losses? Still significant, the gross loss in Q1 was $24.5 million, and the adjusted EBITDA loss widened to $43.2 million. Ouch. So costs are still way higher than revenue. Way higher. Yes, GevNet income was positive, but that was due to uh, non-cash accounting stuff, fair value adjustments on warrants and things, not operational profit. Right. Got to look past the headline gap number sometimes. Is the cost structure itself still a problem? It is. While cost per unit is improving, the total gross loss is still large, and operating expenses are actually increasing up 46% year over year in Q1. Spending money to scale, presumably. Yes, investing in sales, R&D, admin to support growth, but it means revenue needs to grow even faster to catch up. Which leads to cash burn, I imagine. Big time. They use nearly $29 million in cash just for operations in Q1. That's almost $10 million a month going out the door. $10 million a month. So they absolutely need that financing or a very fast path to positive cash flow. Exactly, which highlights the reliance on that Cerberus and DOE funding we mentioned. Future DOE money isn't guaranteed. It depends on hitting milestones. And the Cerberus loan. There's a final milestone for that one due by July 31st, 2025. Missing these conditions could squeeze their cash significantly. Okay, funding risk. What about shareholders? Dilution? That's another big one to watch. There's a potential share overhang from Warrens and Preferred Stark, mostly held by Cerberus. Overhang meaning? Meaning there are securities out there that could become common stock. Cerberus recently filed paperwork allowing them to sell registered shares if they convert. How many potential new shares are we talking about? Potentially around 253 million shares could be issued if everything converts or gets exercised. That's more than double the current outstanding shares. Oh, Significant potential dilution. More than double. Yikes. Okay. What about just general execution risk? Building factories, automating, signing deals? Huge execution risks. Scaling manufacturing is hard. Implementing automation smoothly is hard. Managing supply chains is hard. And turning that massive $15 billion pipeline into actual paying orders, that's a massive sales and project execution challenge. And they're not alone in this market. Yeah. Competition. Fierce competition. You've got the established lithium-ion giants with deep pockets. Plus, a whole bunch of other companies working on different long-duration storage technologies. 
It's a crowded field. What about their track record, historically? <laughs> historically, it's exactly. been tough. Consistent negative gross margins, significant net losses year after year. To hit their 2025 revenue guidance, they need a very steep ramp up from where they started in Q1. Is there a risk of relying too much on just a few big customers? That's been the case historically, yes. Customer concentration. And while those big MOUs are great, they also represent potential concentration if they become the bulk of the business. Relying too much on one or two big contracts can be risky. And finally, dependence on government policy. Yes, those IRA benefits are great, but if policies change, if subsidies get reduced or regulations shift, that could really hurt their economics and demand. Okay, a lot of risks to balance against the opportunities. Yeah. So the big question, the path to profitability, when might it happen? Is there a timeline? Well, there's no specific date circled on the calendar, at least not publicly. It all hinges on executing those key steps we've discussed. The automation the production scaling. Exactly. Those have to work and they have to drive down costs enough to get gross margins positive and then significantly positive. And revenue needs to climb steeply to cover those operating expenses. Right. They need to convert that backlog and, crucially, chunks of that huge pipeline into real recognized revenue and fast enough to outpace the spending. Management reaffirmed their 2025 guidance, though, 150 to $190 million. They did. But they also indicated it would be heavily back-end weighted, meaning they expect Q3 and Q4 to be much stronger than Q1 and Q2, largely because of that automation coming online. So show me second half of the year. Pretty much. But again, no firm timeline given for sustained profitability or positive operating cash flow. What role do those production tax credits play in profitability? Potentially a huge role. Actually realizing and monetizing those credits, that $45 plus per kilowatt could be a major lever to improve the bottom line once they're producing at scale. It's a critical piece of the financial puzzle for them. So for you listeners tracking EOC, what are the key things to watch in the coming months? Number one, automation implementation. Does it get completed on time early Q3? And does it deliver the cost savings and output boost they expect? Okay, automation. What else? Revenue growth quarter over quarter. Is it accelerating like they need it to? Gross margin trends, are they consistently improving towards positive territory? And keep a close eye on that cash burn rate. Is it coming down? And by blind conversion. Absolutely. Are those big MOUs turning into firm orders? Mm -hmm. Are they announcing new concrete deals? That will be a key signal of future revenue. Okay, so to wrap things up, EOS Energy Enterprises. Interesting tech. Big market opportunity in long duration storage, strong domestic manufacturing angle. But also facing significant hurdles, execution risks and staling, ongoing losses, high cash burn, reliance on funding, potential dilution, and fierce competition. It's a high risk, potentially high reward situation, typical of many companies emerging technology sectors. The potential is there, tied to the energy transition, but the path is definitely not guaranteed. Precisely. So. As always, we strongly encourage you, our listeners, do your own thorough research, dig deeper into the financials, understand the risks fully before making any investment decisions. Couldn't agree more. Thank you for joining us on this deep dive into EOS Energy Enterprises. If you found this useful, please do subscribe to Stock Explorers for more analyses like this. And yeah, give us a like if you enjoyed it and hit that notification bell so you don't miss our next exploration. Thanks for listening.